Across the West on FM, DAB and online. This is BBC Radio Bristol. Ben Prater, get off my lap! The only boy, the, the son of a butcher man. <laughs> You're was, not the son of a butcher man, I, are I'm you? not, but my friend you, is. Yeah. God, I like the way you sneaked a nice song in there. He's the son of a butcher <laughs> man. I couldn't get out of my head I the whole way here. What, don't give up the day job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, I went after it at the moment. I've, I've you know, survived the cuts. This feature survived the oh, cuts. Oh, thank goodness. Do you so know it's what, not Ben? Prater, get off my radio station. I, I thought you might be hitchhiking down here to get here <laughs> with all these cutbacks. Do you know what, as well? I was so concerned about your, your lack of income that I've got your lunch sorted. It'll oh, be in a little bag. That's here. really nice, really thoughtful. And, of course, a tough time for other colleagues who weren't so fortunate well, as me. Well, you can take this back and share this around the office, then. There's some... Uh, Jup- Delivering apples first, Jup- is it? Jupiter apples and conference pears, so you can take Ooh. those home with you. It's the right time of year to pick them. They're lovely. Look at the tweaks. You've got half yeah, a tree I know, still on those rich. I those off today. It's not like going down, down the supermarket where they're all wrapped up in plastic. <laughs> I was down there the other day. They had six in there for a quid, and I looked at our tree and thought, there's two grand's worth on there. I know. It's ridiculous. Have you made it much crumble so far? Oh, my, we're, o- we're overdosing on crumble now. That's the thing, isn't it? They all come at once, and then sort of come February when you want them. Them, they're all gone but um, I'm excited about it today although I'm more excited <coughs> if it's not too strenuous I can hardly oh. keep my eyes open children who children. would have them yeah they do they do wear you out don't they? how was Butlins oh <laughs> tiring you Mrs Cornock the you mini Cornocks all down to my of, head you call it a holiday but it's not really is it you go there and, and you the kids run you around everywhere and then at the end of the evening you collapse on the sofa into a, <laughs> in front of the telly and fall asleep don't you there's not much farmyard down there I no so it was a nice getaway it was actually it was nice and nice on the beach with the kids and see you know, Jack loved the seaside and everything although the funny thing was the other day I we went to the tip on Sunday and when we left the tip he goes daddy that was a special treat wasn't it what about the holiday we've just had for a week? The tip costs nothing. The tip costs nothing. It's cheaper than the zoo. They do like the tip, kids. They, they do. They? Is it because all the different rubbish going yeah. all different ways? There was a big digger down there as well, which kind of like, you know, kids love all that stuff, don't they, really? So putchering today. Anyway. Do you know what so many people have said? Um, what is it? What, yeah, what are you on about? You're off putchering. I said, I can't be bought. I, I haven't got time to explain it. I said to Alex Baxter from Points West, Google it. Well, that's right, actually. It's on Wikipedia if you want to look up Seven Salmon Putchers. But this is brilliant. OK, this, this really emphasises the importance of local radio because this is a really regional kind of way of fishing. The guys um, we're going to meet used to fish in the, se- in the River Seven, but they, they didn't just fish with rods or nets. They used these things called salmon putchers, which are made of willow. They actually are going to make one for us today. And they're conical things, and they put them on their side in the river and um, they're all in sort of banks, if you like, and as the tide comes in, the salmon come with them, and then the tide goes back out, and the salmon are trapped in the putches. Now, I kind of, I only know a little bit, really. These are the experts, really. But my point is, you know, I, I'm aware there's a lot of cuts in local radio, but... They're debating it this week in Parliament. Are they? Yeah. Well, this is, the thing is, what you're going to see, t- or what we're going to talk about today, is so important that we capture, because these guys... They're the last of the, uh, the traditional um, putcher makers. These days, nowadays, they use stainless steel ones or aluminium, and there aren't that even that many people doing it because it's so easy to go to the supermarket and pick up a salmon. And these guys are in their 80s, and what you're capturing is, is a kind of piece of West Country magic, if you like. Now, if we, if we lose the things like local radio, how are you going to find these, these sort of people? You know, Because we don't want it all to end up like a homogenised supermarket and all kind of like bland. We want to see the individuality of this country, I think. And local radio is good for that. So what we're doing today is kind of perfect for local radio, really. It was very emotive. Yeah. I didn't give you any piece of paper with I words I know, on you it. didn't prime me I'll on that. i just say, because it's a sensitive time. I can't be, you, you know, can't made out to look like anything, I'm but passing I... you um, party political well, broadcast. Well, I'll tell you what, Ben, it's really interesting, because I didn't really listen to Radio Bristol, I have to confess, until we got involved with this. And I, I do listen to it on the iPlayer, because I usually can't hear it in the parlour very well. But what struck me about Radio Bristol is you do capture the very individual people around the West Country. And... I think that's really important. You know, it's not important to someone in Birmingham, maybe, but it's important to the local people around Bristol and the South West. And if, if you wipe out all these local kind of shows like yours and, and we end up with one that's just covering the whole country, what good is that to anyone, really, you know? You're capturing local history as well, really. Well, you're not that old. Well, I'm getting there. <laughs> in the land, right, you can go with that yeah. dirty old... I've got, got a nice gleam. I've still got a gleaming white car. They haven't taken the company car off you no, yet, That Rolls Royce you drive round in is still all right, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we 
Rich, they said they knew you when you were knee high to a little country yeah. grasshopper, a Titherington grasshopper. Well, I forgot to tell you actually, these gentlemen here, when as well as catching salmon, used to be um, AI men, didn't you? Indeed, yeah. Artificial inseminators, and used to go around the, the farms um, inseminating the cows. We're getting them in calf, hopefully for us. And uh, yeah, I remember when I was a little lad running around the farmyard. You turn up when Dad phoned up and say, "Come on." Well, how long ago did you retire, Derek? Bucket and towel and soap all put ready That's for right. us, you know. Well, how long ago did you retire? I retired in uh, 1991. Right. Yeah. 95, 95 for you, Don, was it? And I mean, do you miss that that AI lifestyle? How, how often were you going around to the? Was it a daily well, thing? Was it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, daily thing. Seven yeah. Days yeah. Week, yeah. Seven, well, well, you got yeah. to do the farmers really well, didn't you? Not, well, even yeah, Christmas Day, we used to go out. Not even a break on Christmas yeah. Day. Oh no, we didn't. We used to go and still inseminate well, on Christmas Day. Oh, give him a day off. Give him a day off. Look at this tiny bloke. He thinks on a Friday night we all pack the cows in a barn and leave them till Monday. And so you've always butchered as well, have you? Uh, well, since uh, 1965. Look at this man here, he's started oh, yeah. already while well, we're talking. I'm glad, now, just on, just before asking what he's doing with that wooden tool, I'm glad he's put the other blade down, because Derek here was waving it around as he was telling yeah, me the story. Look how disconcerting that is. I've got as a cleave. So that's a cleave. Yes. All these photos on the Facebook Divided site. Divided in three. All right. On the face. Two and a half inches across, and you select a willow rod. Yeah. About two inches through. You just start on the top of the knife, put three slots on there, you part that in there, and as you push it down, it splits the round rod into three sections. It looks quite blunt, that wood, doesn't it? It's surprising how, how it works so well, well isn't yeah. it? You think it would be a blade, wouldn't you? Yeah. It just, it, I mean, willow does um, split, doesn't it? I mean, that's the whole point of well, yeah. pollarding willow trees. If I don't pollard them, they, eventually they, the tops split because it, it's a wood that does that. But um, that is impressive, isn't it? That's, that's how you get them. Is that little tool there, is that something you've had for years? Is that what something handed down to you or something? That was... I inherited that when I married my wife. Yeah. That was her grandfather's. So when you started learning to do putches, how, how on earth did you suddenly decide to start doing it? Or was it something that you handed down through your generations of your family? No, no my father was never into fishing, but my father had a very good friend, Mr. Victor Knapp, and I learned a lot off of him. Right. Uh, he was putcher making. He fished Obry on Severn Salmon Lodge underneath Obry Power Station now. Mm. And we used to go down there nights and as a lad and that's how we sort of started yeah. off meddling with a bit of withing so i mean if you want to explain to the listeners i mean how did you before we make a or you make a putcher how did you go about catching the salmon what did, can you explain how you put the putches in the river and what the process was well the, basically the, the putchers are in a weir which is a licensed site so we had 300 and 360 at barclay 360 a lot of putchers, yeah, isn't it? putchers yeah uh, 360 butchers in in the weir. Uh, basically, the, it was posts and three butchers wide, so that was two rows, six butchers in each bay. And the posts were let down into the marrow. And the position, what was marked on the map in 1865, that was when it was licensed, that was the only spot you could put them. And if the rock broke away, you couldn't move forward or back to go on new rock. You had to go deeper into the river bed. That so 360 old putchers. putchers. How many how many salmon then would, would that catch? Oh, we went 41 tides without seeing a fish. So you don't catch one every tide. Wow. So um, you've got to rely on nature, haven't you, eh, Derek? Yeah, well, yes. There's it's about several factors as regards to the, the catch, really. Um, depending on the weather conditions and the wind has got something to do with it as well because these salmon always swim into the wind and so the advantage is having if you've got putchers set on this shore uh, a suitable wind is um, anywhere between uh, north and east because when the fish are coming up on the flood tide they're swimming into the wind so they draw into this side of the river and when the tur tide turns, the fish, the, the putchers are set on the ebb. Our putchers were set on the web. Not all putchers are set on the ebb, depending on the site of the fishery. But our putchers were set on the ebb tide, so that therefore, if the fish were drew to this side of the river on the flood, they were more chance of catching on the ebb. You sense they know every inch That's of that amazing, waterway, isn't it? Isn't it? When you used yeah. to walk out on there, you had to walk out only at certain times and certain spots because it's quite dangerous, to isn't it? On to the out, out uh, six hours after high water at Bristol. That's how we used to go out. And um, that was at about the earliest you could get out. But if it was, of course, if there was a gale blowing, that was delayed probably half an hour or more. 
So when you actually did get a salmon, who would buy them? Was it all, you oh, know, yes, it was one a, for you, one for someone else, one for you? you know? Yes, farmers, um, hotels. I've sent them up to London, up to the Barbican in London. And, uh, yeah, it, it was never any problem to sell them. The problem was catching them. How big were they? Oh, varies. They'd vary from, um, from uh, about four or five pounds up to, well, the biggest fish we caught was 37 and a half pounds. But they came very scarce. You didn't get too many big ones. And what, what would you flog a thirty-seven pound salmon for then? What? How much would that cost? That that was when we started fishing in nineteen sixty-five. I think this fish was caught in ninety about a year after, and the price was fifty p a pound, and we sold it to a farmer. Do you miss it? <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you get up all hours a day, and you know you go down to the river as, as the tide comes round. You've got to get up in the middle of the night might be pouring with rain you go down drive down there change into into breast waders wade out look look go along all the putchers nothing there back again change come back home and if, were you two a sort of team work. for a while were you yeah, yeah we were a team yes yes there was three of us to start with and then the other one retired but we went on you two must be in your 60s now eh Derek to be 85 at the end of, 80 85 at the end of November. Bad, See, that's why you'll, you'll look as healthy as him, well, 85. I hope I do. If, I, if I'm around 85 like these two gents doing this sort of work, All I'll be fresh happy. fresh air. I'll be there still in the city. Yeah. Look at my eyes getting more and more <laughs> saggy. Well, we'll, we'll get, get you out here making a face, won't we? Me and you still be doing this radio feature when I'm 85. What sort of stuff are we talking about then? You'll be still moaning that I'm not actually doing you anything. You won't be coming down a You're car. still standing here with your microphone, <laughs> pray to do some work. Yeah. No. All right, stop chatting. Sorry, Let the man, do some work. Would you do call some work? Oh, Derek's over hard. there doing the right. leaning over. Derek's doing right. That's not true. That's the there. nine staving. That is the main staving. That is the full length. One. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now we'll wave a wand round there. So how long did it take you to collect all this willow then? Oh, we we went and cut this uh, down in the meads. Uh, it took us a morning to get this bit off and get it back home look at this this is brilliant now we're weaving this round talk us through don what you're doing here well you, you twist two with this together that is the crop end the small end of them you put the two together and wind them round then you start off with, on the split one because you won't put a meter lo- all these others will have a meter put to them that's a short stave going alongside of there when i put this bench ring on so once we get this ring completed we can then put the meters in I mean, the thing is, it's, it is a real... I love this, because it's a real skill, you know. To, if we tried doing this, what would we end up with? No, I mean, you can try in a minute. Well, we'll have a go, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can we'll still have a go, Rich. Yeah. What are we going to catch with the one we make? You didn't see us make the sausages, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that was um, hideous enough. They tasted all right, though, didn't Although they? they're a bestseller. Yeah, they were bestseller. Don't want to mention it too loudly. Yeah, yeah, I know. And award-winning. Well, yeah, award-winning well as well. there, aren't yeah. we? Best-selling award-winning sausages yeah. made on with Radio Bristol viewer, listeners. That's a good thing, isn't it? So would you, yeah. would you, did you used to sell these to other putcher people, putcherers? Uh, no, no. This was all for your own? We this, never made you always, it for Yeah, you always made it for your own. Yeah, yeah. just for our own, yes. We never, because when we, at one time, we were fishing, um, when we started off um, in, in 1965, we fished uh, down at um, Cow Hill, and we, there we had um, uh, 150, uh, we had uh, in one rank, a hundred and another rank, and, and we, so we had and another rank with 150. So we had we had three, four hundred putchers then. That was in the, to start with, uh, but we we finished on that fishery, those fisheries in uh, 1972, and moved up to a bigger fishery up on the Barclay Estate at Hayward Rock in 73, and uh, on that was there was was 300 putchers and uh, 20 of the. Uh, big, what they call kipes, big baskets, six feet across at the entrance, tapering down to a, a very small basket at the end in three sections, and that would catch anything from a sturgeon to a shrimp. The, um, a sturgeon had been caught in the fishery at Barclay years ago. Um, we used to catch a lot of eels and uh, flatfish. Yeah, tell me about the eels. Shrimps. Tell me about this is you love well, the eels was, story, don't I you? I bumped into you the other day, didn't I? And um, in uh, Thornby Library, actually, wasn't yeah, I? I was talking about right, how yeah. you catch eels. Yes. Catching the eels, a long bean stick. Yeah. And wool. Get yeah. some mother's wool. Yeah. Knitting wool. Get the worms in the garden. Mix some mustard, Coleman's mustard, mustard. up. Did it have to be Coleman's? Well, that was the best. All right. Put that down the worm's holes in the garden. 
rocks and whatever the worms come wriggling out. You the worm charmer then? Yeah, you, you picked up the best long worms. Of, as long as you can get them about nine inches long, then you threaded A them on. A nine inch worm? Don't yeah. Good soil oh, yeah. round here, Ben. <laughs> hey. You threaded them on a wall then, yeah. thread straight up through them, and that was what you called a clot. That was a clot of worms. And you'd get about a dozen worms on your piece of then, and then tie it on the end of your bean stick. Yeah. And then when the tide was coming in, you'd go down to the river onto the backsis. That was the ledge where the water, the tide comes up to. And just before a high water, you'd watch <laughs> the tide, and you would see the eels, the eels come along after the foreshore right close to you in and out the grass because there was always bits of debris there like and so whenever they nibbled on your clot of worms you put them up over your head and they went straight out the back and then you you went out and picked them up then all right you, i thought you said you used um sheep guts as well didn't you oh we used to, that was into an eel well to bait an eel well ah, right, that was okay. a bath get it right corner. i don't know i'm not an expert like these guys <laughs> no, no. So got it, get uh, out of them uh, eel well <clears throat> the best thing was stomach of a sheep yeah because like if if ever you found a dead sheep in the river which very often there was casualties they were always clean right out yeah. just right to the rib bones what with by the eels yep eels, really? yes they clean them right out yeah. they they would even have the, the salmon if you left the salmon out there right. over a tide hey, uh, eels are disgusting well, when aren't you they? caught Did an you eel think they're disgusting eels I mean, no they're lovely well, i've never tried one you see when you caught it i heard this story you nail their heads to the the garage that's door like, or something don't yeah. you? yeah well that, that's how a lot you know but we used and to then, just put a dinner fork right get them on the old breadboard yeah put the dinner fork through there nick them in the front of the head just cut them about three parts of the way around peel their head back like where which would be the neck bit yeah put the fork down through onto the dead board and then just pull the skin straight off like on them banana and, and it would come out and and, and what do you do how do you cook an eel how do you cook in the frying pan yeah when they're sizzling and God, lovely you, really you Beaut- see i never had something like that oh it's you can't beautiful can't find that down beautiful. the supermarket can you oh. <laughs> are they not Fried rubbery eel? Hmm? Are they not rubbery? No, um. no, no, no. The the flesh would just melt off them. Oh. You you could never you never eat too many. And what about the little ones, the elvers? Oh, the elvers. Oh, I yeah. never went much on them. I've we had n- them. never bothered with them. Because no. they're, they're expensive, now, aren't they? You know? oh, they're very it's expensive. Like hen's teeth yeah, very now, expensive. Yeah. Japanese yeah. love them, don't they? Yeah. But the, the eels we used to catch. Well, you, if you go down and get half a dozen good eels at night, that was a good meal. Yeah. You know, and especially on a thundery uh, July night when there's a bit of thunder about. About a nine o'clock tide, that was ideal time. You're shooting tide, bit of thunder, you might get wet through in the course of catching them, but take your clot, your bean stick, and a lot of the gardens in the village always had a bean clot stuck up by the apple tree or a plum tree ready to just tie the bunch of worms on and go down What the river. a story hey, that is. Great, you've, got, you've got up your game now after stories hey, like well, these I told two you, chaps. I told you it's worth coming down to see these two <laughs> hey. gents because it's a proper West Country stories they've got here, isn't it? Well, no, so what local radio's about, Ben, isn't it? Exactly. Fact, very often there were four or five down there. Yeah. And then we used to get down with a long net and just on the high tide and troll a net down and do a sweep round and get the mullet and various fish like that mm. get an audio get a mullet can you yeah yeah there's mullet down there yeah you just get mullet and a bit of white in you very often you get an odd eel but you had to be quick with the eel because the time you pulled in out the water you was looking for a little hole through the net to get out that was one thing you had to be after yeah, really kind of, none of those electric ones you, know, <laughs> you had your job to hold them in any case whether they electric or not <laughs> yeah, we, we're chatting. Derek's nearly finished this way oh yeah, Derek's yeah, beering yeah. away oh, I don't know. did you care for that eel much then Derek no not really oh. not, not very much no now, this is what they call nosing the putcher up nosing it up yeah okay. this is this part yeah so this is so how you, we've you, always worked Don's done that part no, I've always done this. Well, you've got like a division of labour, haven't well, you? Like you know assembly what you're doing. line, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it gets the, the basic form of it, and then what you sort of finish it off, if you like. Quite a nice assembly line. Yeah, really. oh, it's much better than doing something on a car production line, exactly. isn't it? You know? So these things are what, about One, five, 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 foot, five, six. Foot, five, five foot, foot six? Five foot six, yeah. Okay. yeah that's just about my wife's height, Rich. About your wife's height, probably, yeah, as well. Yeah, about that. I'd like to go home and say, love, you're the same height as a putcher. Oh, I think that'd be a real romantic It would be, I'll tell you You're my favourite putcher, darling. Yeah. <laughs> and they're two foot six across at the at the mouth. And does it have? To, and, it has to they, be. It has to be. Those, they have to be those well, dimensions. Well, that that's a sort of regulation. Oh, it's the regulation. Is it? Is well, that, that's what they always used to do. But um, mm. I'm afraid it uh, it's got expanded because uh, wrongly, I, I must say, this was that should never have been allowed. Um, one fellow put in putchers and and they're metal putchers. 
uh, and they're, they were massive. They were massive, um, yeah. about almost four feet, four feet, I think, so across. Catch everything then, all catch everything. Stuff up. That's yeah, that's good, right. Is it? And they were square. And yeah. uh, that was this is this is the traditional having them round. Yeah, well, this is very sustainable, isn't it? The fact that they can go through any small ones are going to get out, aren't they? Four inches you know? at the top, that, and that is the size of the lave net. We that's a four inch mesh, you see, so that the small fish can go through. And that's the general principle. So you kind of twist in the top up, then you are nosing it up here. This is nose, what they call nosing it up. Yeah, that's it. You've got you, to, I mean, you know the size from just. You're, you know, having done it so many times, you don't sit there with a tape measure. You can feel, you know, exactly oh, yeah. how you get it. The willow is very flexible, isn't it? I mean, you can oh, yeah. sort of bend it don't over. Snap it, Rich. Hey, no, well, that's the whole point oh, of beauty of willow. About, I'm it? sorry about him, Derek. <laughs> you know about this. I'll take you? him anyway. He's going to break your putcher in a minute. <laughs> I mean, if you can make your putchers of any other wood, would you be able to? Or has it got to be willow? No, it, 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 for the for the working, actually, you could mm. use uprights of uh, hazel. Yeah, but, um, but for bending these bits. Yeah, around. but this uh, this is it won't beat with them. The I love this. I'm being immersed it. into country well, life. This is it, Hazel isn't it? Willow. We've got it's your great, isn't it? eels of by January stormy nights over there. <laughs> <laughs> and then tomorrow you're going to go down to the supermarket and buy yourself a piece of salmon from a factory a farm in Scotland, aren't you? I don't like this stuff. Don't you? I love a bit of salmon. And this is uh, what they call Dutch Willow. Uh, it's nothing to do with Holland. It just doesn't come from Holland or anything. But it's the type of willow that grows on the on the pollard trees around the right. farm. And this is the best type of willow you can use for this job. Why is that? Because it's more flexible. It's more or? flexible, yeah, it's, and and it lasts well. You see, yeah. you'll get the other stuff which is fast growing, like this mm. stuff from Somerset. Mm. Now, if you put that out in the river, that will only do one season. These will these will do three and four. Right. Because okay. you see, the faster it grows, uh, it. It's more sap in it, right. and um, it, it, it's um, it rots quicker. Yeah. So this is this is the best type. So of when the tide went down, you went out and you had to find out what salmon were there to bring back. But also, would you have to go back and do a certain amount of repair every time you went out all there? Work had to be done. Yes, uh, we used to try and do all the work in the close season, yeah. get it ready. Uh, we had three hundred yards of hedging also on with the, the three hundred putches at Barclay. So that was all we want a lot of maintaining because it was across the current, the tide. Mm. And it took a, a lot of um, hammering with the, you know, we used to get timber come down and hit a section out or something like that. Of course, there's a lot of pollution in the river now. There's a lot of plastic and things like that, yes, debris. But, oh, it, not as bad as it used to be years right. ago. Uh, when we were fishing the, in the, the, with the big baskets, I was talking about catching the shrimps and the eels and all that. Um, it got so bad that in 1985... Uh, we, we finished because there was so much of the plastic rubbish coming right. down and the cups you only had to get a, a cup one of these little plastic cups in one of the, the traps where it, going through the fishery and nothing else could go in afterwards yeah. so why so, is that improving people just being more responsible it's, it, oh yes it is yes it's, it's definitely Exciting, towards the end we were fishing it, it definitely improved whether the, the water conditions were definitely better yes I tell so you what it. you remember all your dates don't you all your measurements oh. I can't remember what I did yesterday <laughs> half the time he's 80 you know 18 oh, that's a bit that's fantastic isn't it it, you know so yeah. was it a, was it a professional gig then you did it all the time or was it I mean, oh years ago some yeah. people used to li- make a living out of the fishery yeah. of course well, yes it that's fitted it. in well being an ai man didn't it because you i mean yeah. i we remember flexible. ai men start you quite early in the morning about yeah. seven o'clock isn't yeah, it and then you'd probably finish lunch time ish or a bit later well perhaps. when we finished our, our day's calls yeah we'd finish for the day really you and see you so time we had time that. to go in you know and that's right and then of course we used to get uh, mm. two days off a week mm. so if there was three of you that was six days covered you see with yeah. the, with the tides you know yeah so that it worked in quite well actually. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, big day for you tomorrow, isn't it? What's that? We like oh, some T B testing tomorrow. T B right? testing. Oh, dear, dear. I'm surprised yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, know. Derek, oh dear Something, dear. Nothing to look TB to. Yeah. day. Oh dear. How uh, what happens then on a T B testing well, uh, day? And we've got the vet coming in tomorrow from the ministry, he'll come in and he'll basically um well he inject I mean I Will he look like the one off all creatures great and small? Uh what's well, his name? Well he's, he's What's his name? I'm not exactly sure because What's the thing the is, it, I can't guarantee who's going to turn up. I mean, it'd just be a guy they send. Um, and he'll come in and he injects them with a kind of couple of um, different injections. I should revise this if you were going to ask me these questions. But basically, he'll, he'll put a couple of injections into their neck uh, and then he's coming back on the fright on the Thursday and we'll measure the size of the lumps. And, he, and from, from what you can get from the readings, he'll work out if they've passed the test or failed. It's a big fingers crossed moment for any um, farmer who has. So you're that. looking for a small lump? Right, um, a big one? <laughs> 
It's to do, I mean, it's to do a comparison. There's two different um, serums that they put in the net. I mean, I'm, you're talking to the wrong person. I haven't got the expert knowledge. I mean, I'm just the guy who puts the cattle through the crash. Farm. It is, but I'm not the vet who's doing the stuff, am I? Um, if you'd asked me, if you told me you were going to ask questions on this, I would have revised we it. We don't then. do polish, Rich. We don't do Well, polish. this is real life, isn't it? You know, and um, the basic thing is that he compares the size of the lumps on the animal and from the readings he'll get from the measurements, because he measured before and after, um, he'll be able to ascertain how they've reacted to that um, those injections and, and basically decide whether they've got TB or not. That's a very simple version of it. I can tell you next time you come the full facts. By the time I see you next time, I'll know whether we've got TB on the farm or not. So it's a worrying time. Every year we have that test. And we did have a TB reactor about three years ago. And it closed. we closed down, couldn't sell anything. And we had to test for 60, every 60 days. And we had to have, I think, two or three um, clear tests before we could sell anything. So it's a difficult time because TB's rife around here now. Whether you want to get into the politics or not is another matter. It's all a bit touchy, isn't it? With you know talking about badger coals and stuff like that, and I don't know what the answer is. You know, well, I take your view. What's your view? I don't. Well, I tell you. I tell you what. I've been. You know, I do quite a few talks. People keep asking me about the TB testing, and I can only tell people what my experience of it is in the fact that we have a thing called a closed herd. Okay, we don't buy any cattle in, we, and we rear our own replacements, so we haven't got cattle coming to the farm. Um, and we generally speaking normally pass a test but about three years ago we had a reactor so where's that tb come from now you can start looking around saying well it's not come from the neighboring farm because there's no cattle immediately next to us so it's probably come from something on the farm and people are pointing the finger at badger but there's also uh, tb in um, deer as well which we've got a lot of but my other experience of this is that we did find a dead badger and um, i actually got the ministry of ag at the time to come out and test it and they took it away and analysed it and found it riddled with TB in its throat lesions in its throat and stuff so I don't know you've got to when people own... ask you about it at like WI meetings and wherever else I mean what are they passionately against badger coals I think that, they... uh, generally speaking most people understand there's an issue but it's like what the answer is I don't know I mean from my point of view I do a lot of wildlife conservation on the farm and now they're on about shooting wildlife I'm not particularly comfortable with that at the same time if we lose a, lo- a large part of our herd, it's the end of our income, and so that's a real problem. And it's costing the country. I read somewhere, I don't know if this is right, ninety million pound a year because of the cost of the testing and the, the replacement of the cattle. Twenty five thousand cattle a year, or something going out with it. Um, it's a real problem. And the thing is, it's a problem that's got worse over the years. If if um, they've been dealt with maybe twenty years ago, we wouldn't be in the situation we're at now. Um, but don't ask me for an answer because I'm on the fences a little bit myself in the time we've put that to bed uh, look the two chaps look at Derek this and Don, they, they, they don't hang around do they willow for leather aren't they it's look brilliant them. isn't it you no there's a new bit of legislation that i've always got to hold the microphone oh, Richard. Just, you don't like doing any work you ben you've got a look at your hands the red button. yeah exactly look look. exactly Don look how says, soft these hands are look at that soft. look <laughs> soft hands i have got very hard oh, oh. my hands are so and you've got a wedding ring on if i had a wedding my, ring my fingers would be crushed many a time with that <laughs> have you not, do you i don't wear one well on the farm if i had one of those and i got trapped in anything it squashed my fingers out all oh, right you don't find many farmers wearing wedding rings yep not unless you want to lose a bit of your body. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Rich, right. show us your worth. What What's he going to do, do then, you, Don? You've got to put your thumb on... Hold right. that one down, this put your be thumb on there, like that, right, okay. and lift that behind there. Right. And pull that down. Down the second, like that. No, pull it down the second one down. Oh, second one down. Yeah, pull it down like that to get okay. it down, then hold it down. Yeah. And, and then that it, one... Bring that back over there. That one up No, right. no, bring that one back. This one back? Where yes. To, where to? Uh, this, this side of there. Oh, what, back? Oh, completely no, back. Up, up, no, up over the top. Put Don't little, snap it, really. Oh, no. you put a little kink in it. Yeah, like I know that. you did ah, because you had it the wrong side. Crafty little... Now, now then. Right. Put your thumb on there. Yeah. Now, that, that put, your, one's put your thumb on there and just bear on there and right. take that up over oh, the top. Oh, Yeah. Down like over... Like that? Yeah. Okay. You're doing well. Oh, I think I've put a bit of kink in there. Oh, no, that's all right. Should we get splinters doing this? Yeah. Not really no, not off a green no. withy. No, green wood. Not come green on, wood, Ben. No. No. Right now, that oh, now yeah. that one's springing up a bit, isn't right. it? Is yeah. that all right? Yeah, put your thumb on that. Okay, on that, on that one. Press, and, and press in with that up one. Like that. That's right. It'll bend. Quite pleased with this. This is yeah. looking all right. Actually, should, should catch a few good salmon with this one, don't you think, Ben? <laughs> you can use it as a magazine rack or something, aren't you? <laughs> I know you. You're gonna put your own few copies in it. Peas up it later on. Right, and that one up there. Yes. Oh, we're on a roll now. Look at this. Hey. Now. Look at this, I got the hang of this. Ben, it's not as bad as I thought. Only another 459 oh. to do, Rich. Ah. <laughs> Tell you what, we wouldn't get many salmon if I had to make them. 
Yeah. Take this all winter. When you put your thumb on there, put yeah. it underneath and press. Oh, right, so push it up. Yeah, like that. that lifts it up, like but it's staving. Oh, yeah. You go back and tell Bill you made a putcher and you say, must have been So, did you know my granddad then? Yes, I knew your granddad. I never really knew my granddad because yeah, he died when I was seven. Very well. Did you? He used to always come out with the soap and the water. And did he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, wasn't he? He yeah, that's it, Tom. He Tom wouldn't. Corner. He wasn't very well. That's right. He and died in '75. That's right. And uh, he went down to see Doctor Prowse and come back. And I seen him the next day. And how did he get on yesterday, Mister Cornet? Well, I said he'd give us some pills to take. I said, but I ain't gonna have too many of them. I'll, really? te I'll tell you where they be. And he was <laughs> up over the wall plate on the cow shed. <laughs> oh, he's thrown his pills away, hadn't he? Yeah. No, he didn't throw them away. Oh. No, he just put the box so he's Janet left. wouldn't find them. Really? Yeah. So he didn't get told he hadn't been taken? No, no oh. he, he had them outside so he knew when he could have his medicine and when he didn't. Oh. <laughs> Don't you take your pills when you're told to, don't you? Oh, yes. I'm not on any medicine. <laughs> Well, it's another quality episode. Brilliant, isn't it? I'm so glad we came down here today. Yeah. They're very modest, aren't they, these they chaps? They are, but they're wonderful guys. Good and, uh, glad you've come and meet them. No, thank you, chaps. Two, two of the remaining Putcher men. Yeah, that's right. Two last of the, of the Putcher men. The last like of the film, film doesn't it? Does, yeah. yeah. A Hollywood epic. Yeah, you've been on Who TV. Who would play you two in The Last of the Putcher Men? Which actors would you like to play you, gents? I don't know. You know, Cary Grant, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no. no, never be in a match, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to top this one then, Rich? Which other friends have you got in high hey, places? Well, I've got a few up my sleeve yet, hey. mate. Don't you worry. <laughs> Still to come before Christmas. The cheese, no, no cheese after, after Christmas. Christmas. You, you're trying to wrap, keep me going all the time. I've got, work, I've got to do some work to do, you know, <laughs> yeah. mate. I've got some farming to fit in at some point. <laughs> And you, do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you know. Yeah, his dad and his brother <laughs> will do all that. Oh, yeah, they'll be well chuffed yeah. when I tell them that. So the cheese is coming up after Christmas. Yeah. So before Might Christmas. We'll get you down and we'll pick a bit of mistletoe or something. Oh, that'd be nice. You'll keep the office party going, haven't you? That'd be nice. That'll save on the cutbacks as well. They won't have to buy the mistletoe for the office party, will they? <laughs> hey, I'm always like to save the BBC a few quid. And, fellas, I think there's one more thing to say before I get back to. Uh, Back to city life. Ben Prater, get, get off, off my, my butchers. butchers. <laughs> <laughs>